Uh, welcome to Palm Sunday. My name is Pastor Moses Barrios, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm so glad to have you with us. If you're visiting us for the first time, whether here on campus or online, you must know a few things. Number one, God loves you. You are safe. You are welcomed. You are loved. And God is well pleased with you. Certainly in a day like today, I pray for the people of Ukraine. I pray for the people around the world who are experiencing injustice, oppression. And I say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It was a pleasant and warm summer evening in the city of Hamilton, outside of Toronto, Canada. My mother's cousin, Alvaro, who is um, originally from El Salvador, and his wife, Lois, graciously were hosting us as we decided to take a vacation uh, in 2017. Brenda, a Canadian, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd rather her out, she's a Canadian. She was born in Toronto, and so she was excited to go back to her homeland. The kids were swimming in the swimming pool, having fun, and then the dinner time arrived. And that's where we sat around this table in the outdoor, right next to the pool, and we ate these really delicious sausage sandwiches. After all, Alvaro is the chef of five local universities, so he knows what he is doing. We had this really nice conversation, getting to know one another, telling stories about the family, and then came the moment, the moment that he said, Mama Menche. Mama Menche is the nickname of my great-grandmother. Can you imagine with me for a second, this very, I mean, I'm short, but she was very short, elderly woman, but with such passion for life, such passion for Jesus, that it just oozed out of her. She was always doing one of three things. She was either praying, and usually on her knees, or she was reading the Bible, or she was preaching to someone about Jesus. She would always be the first one up to share her story when testimony time came. If you don't know what testimony time is, ask me later and I'll let you know. But Alvaro shared these stories that I had only heard from my mother, told me about the time when Mama Mencha took care of him. And he thought he was going to play with his toys and have fun with the neighborhood kids. But of course, when Mama Mencha takes care of you, what that truly means is that Alvaro was going to be Mama Mencha's ministry assistant for the day. See, I remember stories of how my great-grandmother would uh, take these small plastic bags and fill them with rice and fill them with beans and how she would go out to share the good news in word and deed and she would give away these bags of rice and beans to the most needy. She would always say the gospel is not just words but deeds as well. Alvaro and I laughed that evening sharing our memories, our stories and here I was in another country and yet my great-grandmother was present. We could relate to one another because we had this common shared experience with Mama Menche, and it was clear to me that she was put on this earth to push us, to push us forward. I would say to you, to teach us to live with courage. She worked hard, served the church, loved people, loved Jesus. She was not a clergy member. She was not an ordained pastor. She had no seminary degree. That She was not part of any church staff. But you know what she was? She was straight up bold. She was straight up courageous. No fear, no shame, no hesitation. Nothing could stop her from speaking about Jesus. And today... I'm well aware that my great-grandmother has changed me forever. I can feel her close in much of what I do. I carry her within me, shall we say. As I do my grandmother, also a woman of God, 
both resting in God's presence. Some Latinx theologians call this abuelita theology, grandmother theology, for they show us what God looks like. I've titled today's sermon, Healed Just a Little More, because the wisdom that was read, it derives from the ancient holy scriptures known as the Bible, and we get to glean from these words and that have been around for thousands and thousands of years, passed on from generation to generation. But see, these words offer clarity, but they also offer ambiguity. These words are absolute, and yet they're always evolving. These words are words of love, of grace, and they alter the way that human interacts with neighbor, with the land, with the aina, and with the divine. So this is why we study these words week after week after week. Now let me go into today's passage because today's passage is the starting point of Jesus' paradoxical journey. And surely this journey ties two opposing realities. It binds them together as one because I still wonder how can joy and sorrow coexist? How can triumph and suffering coexist? be associated so closely. You see, one cannot disconnect that Palm Sunday is soon to be followed by Good Friday, and that Good Friday is immediately followed by Easter Sunday. Do you see the paradox? I want to paint the image for you this morning because Jesus prepares to enter the city of Jerusalem, but there is something subtle that we may miss. It's as though Jesus wants to offer us a hint to the reader, to understand that all of these happenings were planned beforehand. It is to say that Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was carefully planned. It was not left for the last moment. I mean, think about it. How did Jesus know that there was a donkey, not just any donkey, but a donkey that has not ridden, waiting for him in the next village? That took some planning. And this is the prophecy, by the way. Some 500 years earlier, Zechariah said that the future king would present himself to Jerusalem while riding a humble donkey. 500 years before it happened. Are you hearing me? See, I must say that a donkey in antiquity, it meant something very different than it was for, for us today, the Westerners. A donkey was a noble beast. I always think of Shrek when I say noble beast. I don't know why. But perhaps all of this anticipatory preparation means something. The careful planning of the donkey, the village, the owners of the donkey, the the sent disciples. I wonder, what if Jesus is showing us his very essence through this narrative? Could it be that Jesus is revealing his essence to be this forward-looking, far-sighted, with a deliberate preparation for the future. Someone who planned ahead for the future. And I think this relates so well to the message of Jesus entering Jerusalem because it's a revolutionary act, a direct resistance to the Roman Empire and its powers because no one can be claimed king unless the Roman authorities would say so. I mean, think about it from a modern perspective. It was like a protest rather than a procession. Instead of shouts, it could have been chants. Instead of holding up palm branches, it could have been holding up protest signs. And all the disciples were cheering well well ahead, and not only because it was a religious statement, but perhaps it was also a political statement. And this is why the Pharisees demanded Jesus to tell his disciples to stop. I don't know if you caught that because they feared that Rome would take away their religious and political freedom. But one must remember, where are we in the story? Where are we in this narrative? Because by this point, it was well known that Jesus was an outlaw. He was a wanted man. So why not enter quietly through the back door? Why not hide from his persecutors? Why did Why does Jesus make it a point to be the center of attention where every eye was placed on him? And here, right here, 
in this space, in this time, in this moment, is where I invite you to open up your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit. This is where we invite the Holy Spirit, which is known as our comforter, our guide, our counsel, our help. This is where we are fully present. This is where we come to the divine with all of our issues, problems, concerns, worries, burdens, because the divine is in this room. Because the benevolent God is in this space because the healing God that is putting all things back together listens to us this morning. This is why we gather, because we want to be present, because we want to hear from the divine, because we know that God is in the room. And today's wisdom helps us. It helps us in our journey, in our human journey, shall we say, all the hard work that you endured, all the blood, the sweat, the tears, all the early mornings, the late nights, all the sacrifices you're enduring, there is an inherent goodness to it all. It means you're doing something meaningful. And so today's wisdom is this. Bold, courageous living is inherently good living. I had a mentor who would say, Moses, don't grow weary of well-doing. I didn't get it for very much of my life. But I'll say it again. Bold, courageous living is inherently good living. See, I believe that Jesus once again shows us his essence, shows us his glorious, relentless courage. No fear, no hesitation, no hiding, no running away. Nothing will get in his way. He deliberately confronts the reality of the moment. He doesn't care that there's a bounty on his head. He doesn't care that he's a wanted man. He enters the city so that all can see him. And I wonder, how many of us are living with that kind of courage today? Because I believe today, more than ever before, we need to live with great courage. This global pandemic has changed us. The world is no longer the same. There has been a seismic shift in our hearts and in our minds. Our churches are not the same. Our societies are not the same. Our neighborhoods are not the same. Our rhythms of life are not the same. And so perhaps what we need today is some straight up courage. Did you hear that? Some straight up courage Because to live in this world today, you need courage. You want a good marriage? You need courage. You want to have a good relationship with your children? You need courage. You want to complete your education? It takes courage. You being here this morning, that takes courage. You want to, uh, I don't know, start a family? That takes courage. You want to get married with someone? That takes courage. You want to buy a house? That takes courage. You know, the things of this world, moving from one city to another city, from one state to another state, leaving all the things that you know, okay? That takes courage. Everything in this time and in this world takes courage. We cannot live without courage. I think of our ancestors. Do you think they lived with courage? Our ancestors who paved the way for us, cleared the road, shall we say, to give us a better world, left us a better world than how they found it. I think of Mama Mancha, I think of my grandmother, I think of my mother and my father, who did all the heavy lifting, by the way, who migrated to this country, left their comfort, left their familiarity, because they had no future in their countries, made the challenging and courageous journey to a better country, giving their children a future and a hope, so their blood, the sweat, the tears, all of their suffering, all of their hard work, their courage, it means something to me today. How can I but not live courageously in honor of my ancestors? See, I think of our spiritual ancestors, Reverend Dr. King and his heart for justice, for reconciliation, for black and white America to be united, for the American Christian church to be healed. I think of Thich Nhat Hanh, who recently passed away in January, and his heart for peace 
and on violence, his belief that through mindfulness, listen to this, through mindfulness, this awareness of the present moment, that it can solve the difficult political problems of our world. And I think of Cesar Chavez and his heart for faith-rooted organization for the oppressed and the marginalized, fighting for human rights through huelga theology, strike theology, and his roots in Catholicism, in fasting, in prayer, how they brought about systemic change and justice in this world. How can we not but respond with courage? How can we not but honor our ancestors? They gave their lives to make this world a better place. They sacrificed their lives to change this world. And I know this sounds a bit old school. Have you ever heard of that term, old school? See, I know there's numerous meanings for this, but when I think of old school, I think of the way things used to get done in this world. Our uh, old school to me is hard work, up at dawn, with feet on the ground, with tools in hand, ready to grind. That's what courage looks like to me. You know what else looks like courage to me? Ketanji Brown Jackson. That's what looks like courage to me. The first black woman on the Supreme Court. So good. Setting the tone for many girls, many young women, for women of color, girls of color, for my daughters. They now have an image that they can follow. It's such a healing moment. It takes courage to be Ketanji Brown Jackson. It takes deliberate, forward-looking, far-sighted view of the future to be Justice Ketanji. You know, when I hear of stories of migrants and refugees from various parts of the world, from Haiti, Africa, Central and South America, from Ukraine, I recognize that a country that pretends to be an immigrant-loving country is in fact the opposite. How can an immigrant nation reject immigrants? Migrants who journey for months, even years, seeking asylum, protection, and care, they arrive to our U.S. borders only to be told by a policy, Policy 42, that due to COVID, the U.S. cannot help them, expels them and sends them away, denies their right to apply for asylum. These migrants are experiencing invasion, not just from another country like Ukraine, but invasion from their own country, because it seems that they are going through difficult times in their own country. It is saddening to see and to witness America's capacity for inhumanity. You want to talk about courage? Walking from country to country under treacherous conditions, heavy rains, crossing rivers, hiking trails, not for fun, not for leisure, but for survival, with lack of food, of water, sleep, and protection, full of families, full-on families with children traveling in this caravan, because it is safer to travel in a caravan than to travel alone. Instead, this caravan, some would think it's made up of terrible bad people. Instead, what it is is a family of love and solidarity. Black and brown bodies traveling together, and now white bodies, before they start their day, they begin with prayer. Now that, that right there looks like courage. That right there is a deliberate, forward-looking, far-sighted view of the future. That is the essence of Jesus. You see, I know something that I realized a long time ago, but I don't know if we realize it. But whenever we witness justice, whenever we witness wholeness, solidarity, unity among the least expected, especially in historical arenas of injustice and inequality, something happens to us within. We are healed just a little more. When we see the fuller image of the triune God, our wounds are cured just a little more. When we witness historically racist institutions and high levels of systemic racism begin to turn, begin to be transformed, begin to be healed, shall we say, into arenas of diversity, equity, and justice, then our souls, our eyes, our thoughts, our hearts, our confidence in humanity, they are healed 
just a little more. They are reconciled just a little more. You see, this Palm Sunday, this Passion Sunday, we begin a journey towards Easter morning. But we cannot miss what we witness here today. The essence of Jesus coming alive, how we can learn from Jesus, because he knows something about authentic living. He knows something about fullness of life with a deliberate, forward-looking, far-sighted view of the future with a life of courage, no fear, no hesitation, not afraid of anything. Perhaps this is why he willingly died on a cross, took away our shame, our failures, mistakes, transgressions, our cowardice, gave us his forgiveness, his successes, his righteousness, and his courage, and he rose on the third day from the grave to give us liberation. What do we do with such freedom? What can someone possibly do with such freedom and liberation? Perhaps our only authentic response this morning is to live a courageous life of our own. To prepare the way for the future. Think of your children. Think of your grandchildren. Think of the coming generations. Will they know us as a generation of courage? Or will they know us as a cowardly generation? We must leave this place better than how we found it. May we see Palm Sunday as a celebration of the essence of Jesus, the paradox of life itself. <laughs> May we remember that our ancestors showed us bold courage. They pushed us forward to a better world. May we recognize that hard work is good work and that old school living is beautiful and poetic living, that bold, courageous living is inherently good living, and that when we witness justice, equity, equality, racial unity, well, that just heals us a little more. That just reconciles us a little more, giving us a forward view of the new future where all things are being put back together, healed once and for all, reconciled all. That is the good news for us this morning. That right there is worth shouting for. That right there is worth waving palm branches for. Word of God and word of life, and we all say together, thanks be to God. Let's pray.